All right, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today we're very lucky to be joined by Jeff Kuhn, who's uh, just flown across to us uh, from Hawaii. He's uh, at the University of Hawaii at the Institute for Astronomy. Uh, Jeff uh, did his PhD at Princeton on uh, the internal structure of the sun uh, and uh, measurements of the sun's uh, movement on the sun's surface. Uh, he uh, had an Alfred P. Sloan Fellowship in 1986 and uh, was the winner of the Shenstone Prize when he was at Princeton and was a Phillips Distinguished Lecturer. His career is focused on uh, aspects of uh, solar astronomy, um, gravity and general relativity, um, surface temperature of the sun and the solar constant variation, uh, solar limb distortions and uh, sun's, uh, sun shape, uh, potentially caused by Rossby waves on the sol solar surface. Uh, coronal emission uh, ejections and uh, near infrared uh, coronal observations. Uh, he's also uh, interested in uh, and published in dwarf spheroidal galaxies. Uh, and uh, he's also, as we're going to hear about today, uh, interested in uh, telescope design and uh, development. He's published on off axis telescope designs and uh, also polaram polarimetric observations. Um, so, uh, if you'll join me in uh, welcoming Jeff. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Adrian. You must have pulled that off the web somewhere. I didn't recognize all of it. But. Um, so, my name is Jeff Kuhn. I'm a, a physicist by training, and I went to the Institute for Astronomy about 15 years ago. But I've been interested in a lot of things, and one of them is questions of related to optical and infrared telescopes and instruments. Um, today what I want to tell you about is a project that got started about uh, almost two years ago now. And it's kind of an odd mix of individuals, engineers and scientists, just one astronomer by training. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll give you a description of sort of the motivation and a little bit of history on how this project got started. The, the theme to this is the idea that the, the Fermi paradox, the Fermi question, is really an astrophysical problem, right? And we're pushing to make it more, more of an astrophysical problem than it is really a problem of philosophy or, or deeper thinking. Um, and and the, I guess the three points that, that underscore that argument are, of course, the first one is that, as you know, there are many, many planets now. If you look up in the sky and you see all those stars, there are more planets than there are stars if you were to count the planets associated with all those stars. Um, the second point is that there, there are probably thermodynamic reasons for believing that we have a chance of doing a, a census of um, extraterrestrial civilization related to those planets. And I think my third point is that the technology for detecting um, such, uh, such a signal is, is within our grasp right now. And so, um, if you've thought about this problem, you may know that, that um, the Fermi paradox is, a, is, bas is basically a statement that the Milky Way is not so big, but it is very old. And so, it is, it is surprising to many of us that there's no clear evidence of life outside or, or intelligent life outside of the Earth. And there are lots of ways of understanding that. Um, it, may just be that beaming messages to perfect strangers is an, is an existentially bad idea. It's possible. <laughs> um, people now talk about the information singularity, right? This nonlinear evolution in, um, in what is effectively a digital world. And it may be that that, uh, that, that, that evolution, that nonlinear evolution, effectively gets all of us eventually making us invisible to things like radio surveys or any other survey. Um, early on in this discussion of the Fermi paradox, which really started in the, in the 60s, um, when there was much more interest in these problems from an academic perspective, I would say, than now, um, it was argued that it's not, a, it's not really a problem of communication, but the Fermi paradox is about um, self-replicating probes, for example, in the style of what von Neumann used to think of, and, and that, it's not that it's not that we can't communicate, but the self-replicating problem of, of, of uh, 
propagating information by actually physical, physical objects um, makes it even more of a pervasive and difficult problem. And finally, maybe it's just that civilization is incredibly fragile and we're really alone and likely soon to be gone. Um, that's a, a kind of a negative take on this and not one that I believe. But what we're going to argue is that um, a cosmic census is likely to tell us about the likelihood that civilization is long lived. And I have, I've taken a simplistic view to that and I'll, I'll try to justify um, the, the, the semi-quantitative elements to this argument. Uh, why is this slide in here? Okay, so the exponential nature of self-replicating machines might be the most efficient galactic communication motor agent of change. Did you know, for example, that in Arthur Clarke's 2001 A Space Odyssey, the obelisk was just such an object? And it didn't come out in the story, but in, in fact, um, early on there was a lot of talk about the, the idea that that the, the best way of propagating information was, was by actually sending out machines that could reproduce themselves and that they, they would perpetuate an exponential process. And in fact, that was the, the basis of the monolith. More recently, let me call your attention to a, a, a pretty cool result by Armstrong and Sandberg. You can Google it on the web. And they've put some quantitative meat to this argument of SRPs and, and really argued that the time scale for filling the universe with, or filling uh, actually the universe, but, but more specifically the Milky Way, with sort of 30 gram probes is only a few hundred thousand years. Um, and that's, that's kind of a cool result. Um, so I, I told you I had a simplistic view to this. Here's another way of, of writing the Drake equation which I'm embarrassed to talk about here in this building, but uh, let, let, let me just say that this was a, an optimistic approach to estimating the number of detectable extraterrestrial civilizations based on the number of stars that we start with in our sample, the fraction of those stars that have planets, the number of habitable zone planets, the fraction that develop a civilization, the fraction that warm before the Earth does, and by warm, I'll tell you more about that. That's really the mantra to how I'd go about looking for these. And then this, finally, this fraction of successful civilizations, and those are the civilizations that, um, I'm just gonna divide it into two categories, assuming that civilization either snuffs itself out or it continues for a long time, or a long time is something comparable to the, to the age of the Milky Way. So in thinking about this, think about the idea that here's, here's a timeline and extraterrestrial civilization somehow emerges. Um, uh, here's, here's where we are, that's where our detection technology develops, and either they, either they become thermodynamically hot before or after this period in time, and, and our, the detectability um, depends on that. So, um, make up some numbers. Uh, it turns out that for the scheme I'm gonna tell you about, uh, stars have to be brighter than 13th magnitude and within about 60 light years, uh, and we'll, we'll justify that in a little bit. Um, FP is about 50% have planets, and, and the number of planets in a habitable zone, yeah, pick a number, it's something not too different than a half. Um, in my way of thinking, um, the, the mantra is we're not very special. Okay, so if we're not very special, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make the outrageous assumption that 50% develop civilizations because we're not very special. Um, and and uh, if we're not very special, then you might also argue that half of them are more advanced than the Earth and half are less. And, and you, can, you can put a number in there based on the number of stars that we're gonna be able to look at. And you could, you could say that the number of detections um, and the quantity that we're interested in from this census is the probability that civilization survives. That's that red FS, that's a number. And, and, um, and the answer is that given these sorts of numbers, it's, it's, um, it's sort of 38 times F sub S or it's 7% of the number of stars times F sub S that we could expect to detect. So in other words, that number 38 is reasonably large uh, and as I'll argue, Below, that makes it almost statistically interesting to think about doing a census. So the idea here goes back 
uh, probably goes, goes earlier than Dyson, but as I said, in the 60s, there was a lot more interest in these kind of problems. Dyson wrote, as you probably know, that if you took the idea that a civilization, as it evolves, will need more and more power, then um, as civilizations evolve, and, and, and in this case, uh, this idea of a Dyson sphere isn't really an Earth-like si civilization, but it's a civilization that needs so much power that it, it grabs all the power that its star radiates. Um, such a civilization, you could imagine, or you could speculate, would capture that energy. And the point that Dyson makes, which is a very good point, is that any time we use that power, um, by the second law of thermodynamics, unless we have some um, uh, unknown way of storing the heat, that heat, which is produced, has to be radiated. And in fact, that's a theme, and I think I saw that you guys had a talk from somebody who, who was actually looking for these Dyson spheres some weeks ago. Um, Kerrigan is the last paper I saw, but it was, if you wanted to find, a, and this would have been in the parlance of, so Kardashev was a, a Russian cosmologist about the same, uh, radio astronomer about the same time, who talked about civilizations as being type one, which was Earth-like, type two, which was, oh, they used a lot of power comparable to the power that their star produces, or type three, which is something which uses all the power of a, of a, of a, of a galaxy. And um, to look for a Dyson sphere, which is this type two kind of very advanced civilization, what you do is you go out and you look for an object in the sky which had no visible radiation, but a, a, a stellar uh, luminosity worth of, of infrared radiation. And, and those have been searched for, and, and thus far nothing has come about. Um, it's interesting to look at our power utilization here. And so that this green scale is a, is a kind of a logarithmic plot up here is, is I'm going to measure this, the power consumption or the power used on the Earth normalized by the total amount of power that the Earth absorbs from the sun, okay? So if we were to, if we were to use all of the power the Earth absorbs from the sun, then um, a, a mega would be one in, in these funny units. If you go back to the Roman period, um, and you just count up or estimate the, the power that mankind produced at that time, it was 10 to the minus seven, which I still find to be a remarkably large number. And, and in fact, if you remember the matrix, I remember seeing the matrix and thinking, well, what possible, how could it be that human biological power is any significant fraction of, but it is a significant fraction of the total heat uh, on the earth. And, and the present human biological heat production is, is sort of five times 10 to the minus four. Uh, the optical power production is comparable to that. It's a little bit more than that, but not a lot more. Our present global power production from coal and nuclear and wind and, and everything else is 0.05% um, is of the total power that the Earth absorbs from the sun. I, f I found that to be a remarkably large number. And notice that that number, I mean, that, that is indicative of an impending global warming problem which has nothing to do with carbon dioxide. Right? All of that power we produce gets dumped eventually after we use it and extract the work from it, gets dumped into the environment of the earth as heat. In comparison, if you take all of the power uh, that plants use, it's only about four or five times larger than that. Um, and so current power consumption is increasing at about two and a half times the rate of population growth. And one could argue that as civilization evolves, we may get more efficient at doing what we do with the energy that we use, but it's quite likely that power will continue to, to grow. Now, that's, that's of course um, power that ends up heating the earth, uh, except for one exception, and um, it represents a heat source to the earth which is unavoidable. Here's an example of what Paris looks like uh, from a satellite. And remember the number I told you was that the total power production is a half of a tenth of a percent of all the energy that the Earth absorbs from the sun. If you look down at Paris and look at 10 microns, the intensity contrast is already 
Um, it's a sig significant number. Um, so the, I think I've said everything here. Uh, obviously, global air conditioning can't cool a planet, right? Um, it's like trying to cool your house by opening your refrigerator door. <laughs> um, there is one way that we can avoid this ultimate uh, heat death on our planet, and that's, of course, by capturing solar energy, using, doing work with it, and then heating, heating the Earth, which happens anyway. So rather than waste the, the work that could be done from that energy, we could capture that energy, do work with it, and return it to the planet, and we wouldn't suffer a heat death. And um, I guess these are some other notes that are relevant. So, so my point here is if we're going to go look for a civilization based on thermodynamics, there's a very natural limit to how much heat will be pr produced on the planet. And it's this sort of, it's related to the total energy the planet absorbs from its star. Can't get much more than that because life on that planet will become uncomfortably warm. So think of that as sort of a, a limit point to looking for civilizations on other planets if we could, is to look for the heat signature associated with the evolution of civilization on a planet and the energy and the power that they consume. Um, now, we have to make some assumptions. The, the, the most work that we could extract from energy photons that strike the planet at the temperature of the star is to return. There's a process called a Carnot cycle, which defines the efficiency with which you can extract energy from that photonic source. And we get the most energy out of that, uh, out of that source if our heat enters the planet at a temperature close to the temperature of the planet. The thermodynamic temperature of the planet is, right, the Earth's temperature is determined by how much energy we receive we receive from the sun, and we balance that incoming energy with what we radiate um, back out into space at, at a temperature of roughly 25 degrees Celsius, some average temperature for the Earth. So um, a smart civilization will either uh, heat their planet just with photonic sources and avoid this heat death, or they'll create energy and power, um, but no more than something limited by the, the power that they absorb from their star. So one approach to looking for extraterrestrial civilizations is to look not for a star, but to look for an extrasolar planet, which is um, dark in the visible, um, but thermally very bright. Uh, here's an artist's conception of, here's a, here's a dark planet over here. And here's a, here's a light planet. This is one which is a candidate, you might think, for civilization because they're avoiding their global warming problem. Um, so the handle we're going to use to look for civilizations is based on the idea that the heat, remember that picture of Paris, the heat that civilization produces will almost certainly be clustered geographically on the planet. Now. It's going to be a long, long time before we have a telescope that's going to allow us to resolve a, a Paris or a city on some faraway extrasolar planet. That, that's a, a technically intractable problem right now. On the other hand, um, uh, we don't have to have the resolution of a city on the planet to detect that heat signal, right? So the the way that we'll detect that heat signal is to use the orbit and the rotation of the planet. And as, as that geographically clustered signal comes in view of us from our distant vantage point here at the Earth, looking off to a distant planet, we will see a fluctuation in the infrared or the heat signal associated with that civilization or with that city in that civilization. Now, it's a complicated signal processing problem. I mean, there are natural variations in the albedo of the planet. And you might imagine there are natural variations in the heat that the planet radiates towards us, for example, as a volcano rotates, or, or nat natural changes in the, in, the, in the temperature of the source. So what we've done to prove to ourselves that we can do this is to build synthetic models that observe <coughs> 
not just the infrared heat signal, but also the visible signal from the planet. The visible signal, remember, gives us a measure of the albedo of the planet, the reflective albedo. And the reflective albedo is inversely related to the local heating of the planet. So we can build models that, in, that in, involve um, a combination of visible and infrared observations and look for the rotationally modulated heat signal to see if we can extract something that appears to be a, a temperature source near the temperature, the thermodynamic temperature of the planet. And since we're talking about planets which are in the habitable zone, that's a temperature close to 300 Kelvin, right? Okay, so um, let me show you some results from, from those simulations. So remember what we've got is we've got a planet which is, is, uh, is rotating and then orbiting a star. And when, when we're seeing the illuminated side of the planet, we'll, we'll have a peak. So this, is, this, this uh, plot right here is one orbital period, and then the little bumps correspond to a rotational period of the planet that we've simulated. Um, and the infrared and the visible are anti-correlated. Anti and, and, and the bottom line in this sort of blind reconstruction is that we can see thermally clustered signals that have, um, well, let's see. The, the first point, right, is that we're looking at the infrared flux from the planet, but there's a huge background level, right, because the planet is already 300 degrees. And what I showed you was for a city like Paris, the contrast of Paris is at sort of the 4% level. Now, if you didn't know what you were looking for and you just had this visible signal and this infrared signal, it turns out that, that we were able to reconstruct. Um, so this, this bottom curve was, the top curve was the, the civilization rotational signal we put into our, our data our observations. And, and here's, here's the reconstructed signal, the bottom one. And we found that if the civilization modulated the output heat flux from the planet at the level of about 1%, then with very general assumptions, we could, we could extract that signal. We could see it. So this was pretty cool. It says that, and, and it, it shouldn't be too surprising, astronomers are now uh, using Kepler data, for example, looking at sunspots, uh, star spots on distant stars by looking at, at the modulation or the rotational modulation of, of the brightness signal. And that, that's sort of an inverse problem, right? As a star spot rotates into view, the flux is decreased. And by looking at the details of that flux, we learn something about the surface brightness distribution. And this is the same problem, but extrapolated to a planet. Um, an extrasolar planet around it. So these are signals that are at the level of about 1%, right? And they mean that we need to be able to see with some kind of hourly time resolution, perhaps, the brightness in the infrared and the visible of a planet to deduce the existence of a civilization. Um, in fact, we can do a lot better in finding biomarkers on such a planet. So these are some calculations done by um, uh, Svetlana Berdugana and her group, where she's simulated uh, essentially an ocean plus some photosynthetic materials. And, and these curves, uh, the, the white curve is, uh, is an ocean. The red curve is, is, is one rendition of a kind of photosynthetic absorber, um, the biomarkers that we might look for in a distant, in a distant planet are things like oxygen, right? Non-equilibrium gases. And that, that's a spectrum, a simulated spectrum that shows what oxygen might look like if it, if it was somehow Earth-like. And that's a big feature and much larger than the sort of 1% um, sorts of things that correspond to the civilization markers. Um, so if we can look for civilization, we have an and detected at this level, we have a really great chance of, of finding biomarkers. This, uh, the point of her calculations were to show that an even higher contrast remote diagnostic of life is to look at the polarized light 
This is a, this is a spectrum that shows that, um, look at this green curve. So this is wavelength along this axis. Um, there's a huge contrast in the polarized brightness of a planet due to um, photosynthetic stuff on the planet. Um, so there's a, the, the, an instrument that can detect uh, civilization on planets from this thermal signature is, is going to be um, wonderful at finding other biomarkers. So you probably know that um, the problem then in resolving the light from the planet from the light from the star is that the planet is a lot fainter than the star. Um, this is a plot that shows as a function of temperature. So on the horizontal axis is the temperature of the star and on the vertical axis is the ratio of the brightness of the star to the planet. And what you'll notice is that as we go to stars that have a lower temperature, the contrast gets better. They're still small numbers. This is 10 to the minus 8 here where that dotted line is. Um, and the different, the different um, curves, so the red, the red curve corresponds to observations taken at 10 microns. The green curve is observations at 5 microns. And, and the blue curve is invisible light. And that's essentially just reflected light of the, of the planet reflecting starlight. So why is it that for cooler stars, the, the contrast is more favorable for finding, finding the planet? It's a quiz. Because the cool, so these are stars, these are planets which are in the habitable zone. So if you make the star cooler, then the habitable zone moves in closer to the star, right? And so if the planet is closer to the star and you're looking at, say, the reflected light, um, you'll see more reflected light from the planet because it's closer to the star. Mm, okay, so does that make it more detectable? It's a complicated problem, right? It's that this, if you move the planet in closer to the, to the star, then in general you're, you're, you're subject to more glare from the star in your instrument. And so you have a harder separation problem between the light from the star and the light from the planet. Um, well, so if, if you put all those things together, um, first off, in order to do this problem, you have to have a planet which is able to, astronomers say, resolve the planet from the star. And so you may know that the resolution of a big telescope depends on the maximum size of the collector for the light. And uh, for the angular size of, of a star, and its planet, uh, the separation of those from us is, is just the physical separation of the star and the planet divided by the distance. That's, that's this number right here. And the resolution of a telescope is just lambda over d. The, the point of this is that the separation of the planet from its star is a number. It doesn't change much with distance into the universe. And the wavelength is the wavelength that we measure. It's what it is. So, if d is the diameter of our telescope, the distance to which we can see a planet, a over d is greater than lambda over d, or at the limiting condition, set those equal, right? That equation says that the distance we can resolve a planet from its star is proportional to the size of the telescope, right? d is proportional to capital D. The number of planets we can then detect depends on the volume of space we can see, right? And that goes as d cubed, little d cubed. That's the volume of the sphere that we're looking throughout to see these, to see these planets. So what that says is that the solar neighborhood that we can sample is proportional to the diameter of our telescope, cubed, like the volume. So this is an example of a problem where the size of the telescope really, really matters, right? We're interested in sampling as many planets as we can. And you know, in order to do that problem, we have to have a big telescope. There's just, in this case, no way around it. Um, and, and so the basic physical problem that we're trying to overcome to solve this cosmic census problem is to create a telescope which is very big, but which has very good sensitivity at 
extracting the light from the planet from the light of the star. Okay, we get, we get some benefit in extracting the light of the planet from the star when we make the telescope big because the diffraction limit gets small because we can actually resolve the location of the planet from the star. But we still need some more technology, and that's called a coronagraph. And so a lot of the work to make this work involves minimizing scattered light from the telescope, the atmosphere, um, and, and uh, keeping that light separate from the light we get from the planet. So now I want to tell you about telescopes. Keck telescope, here's a picture of the Keck telescope. You've probably seen this, this picture. Keck telescope has a bunch of mirrors, hexagonal mirrors, um, separated by little gaps. But if you look at a star and you get rid of the effects of the scattering effects of the atmosphere, this is what you see. That's what astronomers call the point spread function of a point source of light. That's the Keck PSF of a star with an adaptive optic system so that we could remove the effects of the atmosphere. Um, for, for the optical types in the audience, the left-hand figure shows the pupil of the Keck telescope and what happens to a wavefront of light when it reflects off the surface of the mirror. Ideally, you'd like that wavefront to be a perfectly flat, uncorrugated surface. In fact, what it looks like is it sees all of the little gaps in the mirrors, and it sees a big divot in the middle of each one of them. And it's that structure in the wavefront that makes this PSF, right? So for 200 years, Astronomers have been making telescopes that are bigger and bigger and bigger, and the aim has been to see fainter and fainter and fainter things. Um, it's time that we make telescopes not to be big, but to have what we call dynamic range. Telescopes that are designed and optimized to see faint things next to very bright things. Keck is not that telescope. Uh, the extremely the European Extremely Large Telescope, the pupil looks like this. I don't think the EELT also is that telescope. So there are telescopes that have been optimized for dynamic range in, in recent years. Here's one that I've been involved in. This is the Advanced Technology Solar Telescope. It's a single large mirror that has no secondary mirror structure above it, nothing to scatter light or diffract light. This is a superb instrument for looking for extrasolar planets, except that it's not very big. It's 4.2 meters across. We're in the process of building this telescope on Haleakala in, in Maui, and it will be exquisite for looking at the very faint corona of the sun against the background of the sky and and the scattered light of the sun itself is minimized. Um, years ago, uh, we worked on a design for a replacement telescope for the Canada, France, Hawaii. And we came up with a design on the left, where each mirror segment is itself part of a parabola and has nothing in front of it. And then the beams are combined at the center. The giant Magellan telescope, a picture of that is what you see on the right. And in fact, that telescope will be very good for dynamic range, and it's pretty big. Each one of those mirror segments is about eight meters across. If we took an inventory of the world's largest telescopes that are planned, there's, or, or built, there's sort of like six of them. The Keck telescope is there. The giant Magellan telescope I just showed you is under construction. One of the mirror segments is now being polished in Arizona. The 30 meter telescope you've surely heard about, it's a big, um, mostly U.S., maybe mostly Japanese project now, which has um, an aperture of, of, of uh, about 500 mirror segments, and it has a total diameter in the pupil of about 30 meters. The, extremely, the European Extremely Large Telescope has a diameter of 39 meters. And for many years, uh, there's a group that's been talking about the overwhelmingly large telescope, the OWL telescope. <laughs> which has a diameter of, of 100 meters. And while uh, none of these, except the Keck telescope, have been built, 
tens of millions of dollars have gone into the design phases collectively for all of them. So they're, they're very serious efforts. Um, and we should think about them and consider them in the scheme of this problem that I'm, I'm now telling you about, which is to look for extrasolar civilizations. So here's a graph that shows um, our estimate of the number of detectable civilizations as a function of the size of the telescope. And if you take the envelope of these curves, so just look at the plus curves, and you draw a straight line through those, what should the slope of that be on a log-log plot? Three, right? The number of stars that we have a chance of sampling a civilization around grows as the diameter of the telescope cubed, important number. Um, there's a big range in the number that we could detect, and that's, that's my, my red arrow here. Uh, so the GMT, there's, so there, there are three points at each diameter. There's a plus, and then the triangle, and then, a, and then an asterisk. And those numbers refer to different assumptions about how well you can build a coronagraph to keep the light of the star from interfering with the light of the planet. And I've used coronagraph performance based on corona, chronographs that we're actually building right now. So g pi and sphere were, were the, and, and what that has to do with is, so you got a big telescope, but you still have to worry about diffracted light getting into the wrong place in your image and confusing your ability to see the planet's light. So the moral from this picture is that really none of the telescopes that we're considering now, even under the most optimistic predictions, the EELT might see 10 extra terrestrial uh, solar-like civilizations. But that's under the most optimistic. Um, the GMT, um, in fact, for most assumptions, doesn't show any. It really isn't until we get out into the owl territory, or in our case, Colossus, which is out here at about 70 or 80 meters diameter, that we think it's worth going out to solve this problem and turn the Fermi question into an astrophysical problem. Um, okay, that's where we are. This is, this is why we want to do this. The question is now, could we do it, and what's going to keep us from building a telescope that big? Well, I hear a bunch of weirdos. Um, this group was uh, formed uh, around this guy right here, who's a, a wealthy private guy who came to me when I was the director at IFA Maui and said, hey, I got a, I got a one meter telescope. Can I put it on your mountain and we'll, we'll use it for doing interesting things? And of course we said yes. Um, but then it turns out he had other aspirations and he said, what could we do for, for um, a really big telescope? entirely as a private enterprise, right? We're staying out of the way of all the other international public projects, but as a private enterprise, what could we do? So we got together some serious people. Um, Dave Halliday is the founder of a company called Dynamic Structures, which built the Keck and the Subaru telescopes. Um, his company is now heavily involved in the TMT, and he provided um, reality in many of the mechanical decisions that we've talked about. Um, back at the end of the table, and, and that is a very nice glass of wine that he's holding, is Pete, Pete Warden, um, just down the road. Pete, Pete was certainly interested and involved in this from the beginning. And then there's a collection of engineers um, and physicists from all over the world. So there's a group from France, a group from Germany, a group from um, Mexico, which has some really cool technology for deterministic polishing. Um, and uh, uh, an astronomer who's heavily involved in planet hunting. Here's the problem. If you take the size of the, of the primary mirror in these telescopes, and here I plot it on a, again on a log scale from 10 to 100 meters, and you compute the mass of the moving structure of that telescope, you find this remarkable, perfect power law. 
the mass of the telescope, of all of these planned telescopes, and remember I told you that tens of millions of dollars have gone into the engineering for these, the mass scales like the diameter of the telescope squared. Now, I find that rather remarkable. It's also rather optimistic, I think. It says that the mass of your telescope only depends on the area of your mirror. But in fact, maybe it's not too surprising since all of these telescopes use a very similar design. Now, what else scales with the mass of the telescope? The cost. The cost is almost directly related to the mass of the telescope. And the cost is about, um, it's about, uh, what is it? I've forgotten the number. I didn't get much sleep last night on the airplane. Um, uh, the, the, well, you can, you can take it from this. So the, the OWL telescope was a $10 billion telescope. Um, so it's, it's about a million dollars per ton of, of moving mass of the telescope. And we started um, this exercise with the Waterton group, realizing that we don't, we're, not, we're not interested in doing this if we can't actually build the telescope. We don't want to try and build this telescope unless we can do it for a cost less than the current telescopes that are being constructed. So the TMT is roughly a billion dollar telescope. The EELT will probably be a several billion dollar telescope. And the OWL is a more than $10 billion telescope, which is, for all practical purposes, everyone believes is too expensive to be built and, and, and sits on a bookshelf somewhere in a bunch of PowerPoint presentations. Um, now, there are some telescopes which break this scaling law. You might have heard of the Hobby Eberly telescope. Hobby Eberly telescope is actually as big as the Keck telescope, but its mass is tiny compared to Keck. Why is that? Yeah, it, it, it rotates, but the optics, the gravity vector, never changes its relative orientation to the rest of the structure in the telescope. So telescopes and the cost of telescopes is all about mass, which is all about stiffness and the stability. So our job is to figure out how to, how to do this problem um, without, uh, without, uh, without that much money. Well, here's, here's, here's what a piece of glass looks like if you support it from the bottom. So this is a, a picture of the surface, and here's a cut through the surface. And this just illustrates, right, the fact that glass, as you know, is kind of a liquid. Um, it's, it's a floppy thing. And the deviation, so this piece of glass had a thickness of 10 centimeters. The separation between each one of those actuators was 15 centimeters. And the, the peak to valley deviation in the height of the glass on the surface was 15 nanometers. 50 nanometers is 500 angstroms, so it's sort of lambda over 10. So actually, that's not a bad mirror. We've just made it look like a bad mirror because we've exaggerated the scale. Now, the thing to notice is that the peak to peak deviation, if you work it out, is proportional to A is the separation between the number of points that you support the bottom of the glass at. So it's proportional to that separation to the fourth power divided by the thickness squared. Okay, so the separation to the fourth power looks like one over the number of support points squared. So I should have written this out for you, but the peak-to-peak -peak deviation, which determines how good a mirror we have, looks like one over the number of actuators times the mass of the mirror, that quantity squared number of actuators times the thickness of the mirror. So if you want to make a mirror less massive, you put more actuators on the bottom of it, assuming that your actuators don't weigh more than your mirror. And that's almost always the case. So the first clue to making a good mirror is you replace glass with some kind of electronic means of making the structure have the shape that you want it to have. That, that's Everybody who builds telescopes knows that. But that, but that that simple conclusion hasn't been pushed to the limit. So we want to make, so our problem is to 
break that mass scaling, we have to do it by, yeah. Does the cost more than the glass? So the question was, do the actuators cost more than the glass? And the short answer is no, not if you do it right. Um, the, the, the issue that is kind of tricky is that you sometimes say, well, okay, so if you're going to push the bottom of the mirror, what do you push against? Do you have to now, are you just transferring the problem from making the mirror stiff to making the backing structure stiff? And the answer is no. And it's a subtle answer, and I'll have to tell you, stick around afterwards and we talk about it. But um, the first thing to do is to make the mirror and, and less massive by decreasing the mass. Okay, so a telescope has three levels of support. It has the glass, it has a structure underneath the glass to support it, and then it has the telescope structure to put everything together, three, the, the truss structure. Um, if you decrease the level one mass of the glass, you get to de decrease everything else. So everything propagates through the system. If you can make the glass not 10 centimeters thick, or in the old days, polymer was almost a meter thick, then you get to decrease every, every mass. And we're talking about mirrors that are eight meters across, which are like window glass, which means lots of actuators, thousands of actuators on the back. So you have to solve an electronic and a controls problem and a complexity problem. But you do it with Wi-Fi networks. And you do it with force actuation rather than position actuation. Uh, I said all that. Can we break the scaling? All right, so current mirrors right now have a mass of about sort of a half to one ton per square meter. That's like Planck's constant, right? It's, it's, it's a fundamental constant of, of making telescopes so far. We want to we wanna change the universe we live in by decreasing that number by a factor of five. And, and if we do that, then we'll decrease all the other masses in the system. It's more than that, though. Because if we're going to make a mirror out of, a, a primary mirror out of lots of pieces, and it gets really, really big, remember, light has a really tiny wavelength. And so we have to somehow, to make an image that's coherent over that scale, we have to make that structure behave at the level of a fraction of a wavelength over, in the case of the Colossus, over a scale of 70 or 80 meters. Now, normally that means it's got to be really stiff. And really stiff normally means that it has to be really heavy. We're not going to do that. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make a telescope which is actually closer to the idea of an interferometer. So it's a bunch of eight meter telescopes that somehow manage to bring all the light to the same place. And then we solve the phasing problems of each one of those mirrors, which is as big as we can make it. So the ingredients of, of the scheme here, first off, to do this problem, we have, we're not going to do the astronomy problem. This isn't about astronomy, although it will do astronomy. But we're not going to try and solve um, uh, dozens of astronomical problems that require a large range of performance characteristics. This is a narrow field telescope. Right? It's a telescope that will see a tiny pencil beam of the sky at a single pointing because, after all, looking at a bright star where a planet is around it is a, is a couple of arc seconds sort of problem. It's, it's a tiny angular size in the sky. Also, we have the benefit of knowing that every place we look, we're going to be looking at a bright star. So we have the benefit of understanding that we can use the light from that nearly point-like, although it won't be point-like, source to solve the phase problem in our telescope. So maybe you've heard about adaptive optics. Every one of these mirrors, which we now make to be as big as we can make it, and don't put anything in front of it because we want to minimize the scattered light problem, every, every one of these mirrors is its own optical system with an adaptive optic system built into it. And our problem then reduces to knowing how I can make each one of these telescopes produce a wavefront which arrives at the same time as the wavefront from every other one of the telescopes that's part of the Colossus. 
Well, I wouldn't say that, but, but it has, you're right. The, the LBT is not a stiff structure, but the LBT has this peculiar optical solution, which, which means that they, they bought some other problems. Here's, here's the optics for this. So, so this is about 80 meters across here, and the telescope is pointing horizontal. If you make the telescope a narrow field of view, then every one of those mirror segments, so this, this optical shape right here is a parabola. And, and every one of the primary mirrors has its own secondary mirror. And this is, this, is, this is the outline of the secondary mirrors that correspond to 60 eight meter telescope mirrors. And every one of those secondaries is only about this big. Um, because it has a small field of view and it's very stubby. It, it, doesn't, right, it doesn't have a great vertical extent. It has a large transverse extent, but the vertical stent extent is, is small. So the, the picture of how this works is that every one of those eight meter mirrors corrects for the atmosphere, and every one of the secondaries is small enough that you can do all the things that we need to do to change the phase of the wavefront or to make all of those images line up on top of one another down at the final focus. Okay? Now, we're never going to solve galaxy problems with this telescope. This isn't to look at faint objects. This is to collect lots and lots of photons, pure photons, uncontaminated by um, parts of the field that we don't want to look at. Um, Dave Halliday went off. Yeah? So do I understand you're going to be looking at one story at a time with this? Yes. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So it has about a three arc second field of view. So it looks at only one star at a time. Um, here's, here's one conception for the structure. We've, we've evolved it a little bit more since then. Here's what the PSF would look like for this if we didn't have any phase errors in the telescope. And the, the core resolution of, of that is a milli arc second in sort of visible arc second visible regimes. And you, this is a geometric ray diagram, and you can see that it, it, uh, it's, it's diffraction limited. Um, we know to achieve the strel that we want, we know that we have to keep the surface waviness down to 66 nanometers, which isn't, which isn't a, a terribly crazy requirement. Now, if you were to take a telescope like this and point it at the sky and look at what the atmosphere does, this is a grayscale plot that shows the phase error on that wavefront due to what the atmosphere is doing. Okay? So each one of those circles is, is a sub-aperture. It's an eight-meter aperture. And where it's, where it's dark, it means the wavefront is advanced. And where it's light, it means it's retarded. And, and the important number here, if, I, if you take this line across here, this is what the, this is what the effective error is in that wave front propagating through the atmosphere hitting our telescope. And the, answer, the point of this graph is that there's about 10 to 20 microns of path length difference from one side of this big telescope to the other. It's actually probably less than that for this. But what that means is that the atmosphere is already creating an error. This is a telescope, right, <laughs> that we designed from the beginning to match the imaging problem diffraction limited imaging problem of a two arc second patch of the sky. Since that's what the atmosphere is doing, it makes no sense to build a structure which is more rigid than the floppiness that we're already going to have due to the atmosphere. And that's 10 to 20 microns. Okay, so that's still a small number over a scale of 80 meters, but it's a lot better than having to maintain the shape of that overall parabola that goes into imaging all these mirror elements um, at, at the scale of um, fractions of a wavelength. Okay, um, it's probably a bad idea putting mathematics in this, but here's the idea. I've got to tell you something about how we get the phases. So the atmosphere is twinkling, every one of those eight meter telescopes is diffraction limited because it has its own aosis because there's a bright star in the field, but we still have 
right, the overall phase of each of those is going in and out as the atmosphere is doing whatever it's doing. So we have to find the phase in this telescope. Now, the radio guys say, well, this is a highly redundant baseline interferometer. It has to be highly redundant because this is a high contrast imaging problem. We have lots and lots of mirror pairs that have exactly the same baseline in the problem that we're solving. And I, I don't want to go into all of this in great detail except to say that we've taken this problem and if I take a bunch of diffraction limited telescopes and I put a phase error on each one of them and I look at a point source, what will we see? Well, if they were all phased properly, you'd see that diffraction limited peak with a one milliarc second core. In the case where the phase is variable, you'll see a bunch of what astronomers call speckles. So our image will be speckly because of those phase errors. But there's only 60 degrees of freedom in this problem because there are only 60 phases for each one of the mirrors. Each one of them is diffraction limited. So we can construct the numerical problem that says, let's just look at the image and look at the speckles and reconstruct the phases from those speckles. Can we do that? And the answer is if you have a big enough computer, you can, and you can even do it on, on millisecond timescales. Here's what it sort of looks like. So here's, here's a diffraction limited image. Okay, so I cheated a little. This is not the hexagonal Colossus design. This is one which is a sheared design. I have to break the symmetry to get all the phases. It's a technicality. And, that, and that's what produces the sort of diagonal shape in, in, the, in this diffraction core. So it doesn't look at all like that image I showed you, but in reality it is because I've expanded the scale so you get to see all the little wiggles in the point spread function, okay? If I change the phase of one of those mirrors, what happens? Did you see the image change a little? It's subtle, but it's there. And for every phase that you adjust, you'll change the speckle pattern a little bit. But in fact, it's enough so that we can actually reproduce the phases distinctly and uniquely for each one of the mirrors. Here's an example. So if I give the mirrors a random phase from 0 to 2 pi, and I image a bright star, you see, we would see this image right here. All right, and the scale here is this, this yellow circle is the diffraction limit from an eight meter, from an eight meter diameter mirror. We actually have much greater intrinsic resolution because the mirrors, uh, the composite mirror is, is 80 meters across. If we go through this reconstruction problem, um, here are the phases we entered, here's the phases we compute, Here's the error in the phases, and, and the horizontal axis is the mirror number. We recover what is a diffraction-limited core with some side lobes. Okay, So there's enough information in a speckle pattern for 60 diffraction-limited telescopes to be able to reconstruct the phase without any extra hardware and to do it fast enough so we can build a narrow-field, highly redundant baseline interferometer. Here's what it looks like. So the telescope itself now looks like this. Have to shield it from the wind. There's very little reason to use a hexagonal pattern because it doesn't effectively use the hole in the structure that we want to use to point to the sky. It turns out one of the engineering problems we have is building the wind enclosure. And the opening in the wind enclosure is a big deal. If we can minimize and match that opening to the shape of the telescope, then we solve another engineering problem. So our, our Colossus now is actually a rectangular array of mirrors, and they're sheared, so we solve a symmetry issue with the reconstruction. And they look through the right size slot. Okay? Um, and look what happens to our scaling law. So Colossus is this red dot there now. So now, according to Dave Halliday, who actually builds telescopes, he built Keck and he built Subaru, we can build an 87-meter telescope this way and 70-meter the other way, rectangular array. And its total cost, based on mass scaling, is going to be less than the cost of the TMT. 
Correct. Yes. It sees the whole sky. That's what it looks like. So, exoplanetary warming is a detectable extraterrestrial civilization marker. The planned telescopes are too small, and they're not optimal for their scattered light performance. Colossus is possible in large part because it's not solving all problems for all astronomers. It's a narrow field of view telescope. We can break the scaling law for these telescopes by a factor of five. And for the cognoscenti amongst you, it is a field aperture, highly redundant baseline interferometer that could detect tens of ETCs in a planetary census of the stellar neighborhood. And finally, we believe that Colossus is the telescope you'd build to look for and study life within a radius of about 60 light years of the Earth. And that's what gives you that number of about 600 systems that we could look at. That's all I had. Um, uh, so Jeff, if I can key off the questions, and I'm sure there'll be some from the audience. Um, so, uh, what sort of uh, spectral range would the uh, Colossus be capable of looking at? Yeah. So, it has to see to 10 microns. So, it has to be a good infrared telescope. So, one of our noise sources will be the terrestrial and the telescope thermal emissivity. So, we have to pay attention to make the mirrors low emissivity. And if we, if we could find a site which was relatively cool, there's even a tangible benefit from that. Um, its performance as we get further down into the visible degrades in its resolution because of many effects, but we expect that we'd be able to use it down, down to the near infrared. So, um, on one of your slides, you saw you, you had a bunch of telescopes, all of which could see sort of 1 to 10 ETCs, right? Yeah. Wouldn't it be really cool just to find one? I mean, it'd be great to find 20, but it seems to me it's worth finding one. I agree. It would, it would absolutely be worth finding one. Um, but if you're going to build a facility, I think that you have to build it and argue that we have, we have, we're going to be able to say something statistically about the likelihood of, of survival. I mean, that's my interest. And, and I, don't, I don't think that you'll be able to say that which with much certainty with any of, any of these other three systems. I have to say that, that at the back of my mind, I also believe that those telescopes will never have the time devoted to these problems. And furthermore, they're not the right telescope. Scattered light from the EELT will be worse than the Keck telescope. And I expect the same thing is true of the TMT, or the efficiency of the telescope will have to be so seriously attenuated by masking the edges and the bad parts of, the, of that system that we, we I, I don't think those are the telescopes that are going to address this problem. So statistical reasons, design reasons, and the sociology of solving this problem. So um, I was actually pretty close to my first question, so I'm going to ask a different one. Okay. Uh, assuming that um, the stars line up, uh, metaphorically, uh, when is the most optimistic time in which you could fund, build, test, and bring this thing online to do science? Oh, there's an easy question. <laughs> so Casey Harlington has funded this effort so far. Lots of money has been spent in a lot of design sorts of things. It's entirely private. Um, the technology that we're coming up with, especially this thin mirror technology, we think is a saleable thing. So um, this stuff is, has patents that have been submitted related to that. If we waited for the technology to be set up and we're setting dynamic structures in Vancouver, Canada is setting up the polishing lab and the stuff to do this, and they may market it, and they might decide that we don't really want to go forward until that's in place. Maybe it's a decade. On the other hand, if we were to convince somebody that uh, this is a telescope less than a billion dollars, um, it will do all kinds of things um, related to narrow field imaging, um, the technology to put it all together, if the money existed, is five years or less. So I think everybody who's involved in this is old enough that 
we're doing it because we, th we want to be around when it happens. <laughs> and, 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 and so um, the optimistic number is five years. If you follow the sort of commercial path that we're trying to put into place, then it's, then it's a decade. Number of these very large telescopes, including Colossus, are based on modular eight meter mirrors. Is there something sacred about eight meters, or is that simply what the Arizona Mirror Lab is able to produce? Well, this wouldn't be an Arizona Mirror Lab mirror. So this mirror, this mirror is this thick. So it's it's about a centimeter thick. Um, when the glass gets too much larger, just the logistics of being able to mate it to its electronic home, this one to 2,000 actuators becomes much more difficult. So it's possible that we could put glass, which is a larger modular size, but not, not a whole lot larger. Um, glass it's is- It's an engineering issue, it's not a fundamental issue? It's not a fundamental issue. Um, it's likely that we wouldn't probably gain very much. So as, as we will make this mirror, there's a process that we call deterministic slumping, where we can where we can actually shape the mirror on scales smaller than the actuator separation without grinding the mirror surface. And that gets to be harder when the glass gets bigger than about eight meters. So there, yeah, there are no, there's no Planck's constant in that. It's, it's just um, engineering. In your Drake equation, you set two of the factors to 0.5 and then it makes it look like you're just measuring that third factor and you'll see, as long as it's not too small, you'll see uh, ETCs. If all three of those factors are like 0.1, you'll see zero ETCs. Right. So how can we have confidence that those two factors set to 0.5 are correct? Um, because, I, because I believe that, that statement in red. We're not special. It's, it's a religious statement. Um, I, I, I think, right, I don't know, is Frank here? Um, um, I, it seems like, it seems like this, is, this equation is a guide to what, to what we're trying to do. And if you, if you built this telescope and found that you didn't see anything, then I think that's also a conclusion because it means somehow that we are special. I, I, I cannot argue with you. <laughs> Yeah, I can, I can see how you need the resolution to find the planet next to the star. But uh, why do you need the 60 mi uh, mirrors? Is that the... Um, well, is that the w we the also have a problem collecting enough photons. And, and so there's a result uh, from interferometry that says that, that the MTF of the pupil function, in order to be able to uh, have a high signal to noise, so this is a high signal to noise measurement, we need lots of redundancy in those, those baselines. And to have the redundancy in those baselines, um, we need basically a filled aperture. Um, how can I, how can I? Uh, otherwise, you otherwise you get a beam pattern and the signal to noise that you measure in your final image um, is in fact not very good. Now, I'll tell you the other reason why we're going to do this is because once we have the adjustment of 60 phases, we can do dark spot coronography, right? We can, we, can, we can make the image plane have a particularly dark spot, right? And by adjusting those 60 phases when it is a highly redundant uh, interferometer, we can make the contrast in that dark spot much higher. To That would be an interesting trade to explore. Um, a, a linear array is, is highly unfilled, though. Um, that's, a, that's a sparse array. And, 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 and my, my intuition, just based on the MTF, is that we, we take a pretty serious signal-to-noise cut hit in, in measuring faint objects at an arbitrary position. But that's something to think about. <laughs> 
Um, so, so what I, I, what I think we're talking about is is this this function right here is what we're solving for these quantities. And so the structure of of these baselines, in the case where it's a linear array, of course, really just samples in one dimension, right? And and so I'm sure that there are advantages to that, but then you've got to get the UV coverage somehow by yeah. Yeah, yeah. Jeff, um, yeah. Sorry. So how do you, what do you use to rule out false positives? Is it the temporal structure that makes this a um, waste heat from a technological civilization as opposed to an astronomical point source in the infrared? Is it the colors? What, what rules yeah. it out? Yeah, that's, that's, so I didn't, I didn't, I didn't talk about that. Um, and undoubtedly, we will have, we will have uh, problems that we can't solve, right? A planet that's covered with clouds, we don't have any sensitivity to. Um, the, the, the baseline is to make measurements at 5 microns and at 10 microns. So you actually have a temperature measurement. And so what we would get is, is, um, is a latitudinal distribution on the planet of, of, of sources and knowledge of their temperature. And so... Um, there's still a jump to be made, right, to argue that it's civilization because, because uh, a bunch of hot water bodies on a planet could, could fool us. Well, no, volcanoes are hot. Volcanoes are much hotter than, right, than, than the temperature that we would expect for a smart civilization to be dumping its, its heat um, at a temperature, right, the Carnot efficiency argument, at a temperature close to the temperature of the planet. Right, right, but but w don't you think that we would see something which is very hot, surrounded by something which is cooler in that case? I I, I can't argue. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, when you say it's a tiny field of view, how tiny is tiny? And uh, if you have a tiny field of view, how do you do a survey? Do you, are you going to be constrained to? Be observing one stellar or planetary system at a time, or, or can you uh, observe like a, a, a big mass of uh, stars and planets uh, in a single view? So to get enough photons to do this problem, we need an observation of about about an hour's duration with this telescope. So we know where these 600 stars are that are within 60 light years. Okay, so you you uh, you, you would say that you're going to know where the stars are. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, but whereas you're you're not just going to point to a tel telescope to some area where you don't know where anything is and uh, start surveying. No, so the sort of observing program you could imagine is, is um, we, we need a, a time series to be able to see the rotational and the orbital modulation. And so uh, you'd observe uh, eight or nine stars every night in some sort of a rotation okay. pattern. But you know that those stars have planets ahead of time. In general, you know that those stars have planets, but we may not. Right? We don't have radial velocity measurements, and for many of these systems, the radial velocity measurements won't, probably still won't be sensitive enough. So uh, the likely scenario is let's just take the 600 nearest stars that are bright enough to do the things that this telescope needs for the wavefront correction, um, and we'll just put them on a program and run for five to ten years. So you need another telescope to do, a sur to do the surveys for you ahead of time, like the Kepler, for example? Sure. Yeah, uh, very good talk. This is a great project. You basically pushing, I have a comment first of all, you're pushing the limit like when we envision GPI and we propose GPI, we had a lot of issues because the com community of cosmologists and extragalactic yeah. kind of scream at us saying yeah. we are dedicating an instrument to one science case. Here you're pushing the, the limit to, you're pushing this to another extreme because you can, you're building a telescope to one science case, which is, yeah. I think, going to be very controversial in our community. Well, okay, first off, we're not building this for astronomers. We're not going to the astronomical community. We're not going to the national community to find money. Um, the money that we have is from private sources. And we're not going to compete with the astronomical community to try and build this telescope. We have no interest in that. And they have no interest in that Maybe. also. That's a good way to avoid so, this drama. So, um, <laughs> well, but, but, right, this is the most important problem we should all be working on, right? This problem is the most important problem that we can imagine doing. And we've attracted all kinds of people 
who said, yes, I want to work on that problem. And so, I, so this, the sociology is an important question, and, and, and I tried to indicate that this is, is not being designed for astronomers. Could you tell us a little bit more about the adaptive optic system that you have in mind and the coronagraph? Okay, so one of the, the points that was raised is that we have, we have um, very accurately measured phases of each of the mirrors. So we can do dark spot coronography, right, where we adjust the phases to make a dark spot in our image plane and move it around, right, over that hour observation on an individual source. So the coronography is likely to be that style of coronagraph. The AO system um, requires, right, the AO system will be matched to the actuator geometry on the primary mirror. So the AO system is an extreme AO system. With yes, it's an extreme AO system. Exactly. That's right. And so what we'd like to do is um, build 60 adaptive secondary mirrors. So the AO would be done by the adaptive secondary. Uh, and by the way, that also handles the tip tilt and the focus adjustment in the final image plane. Jeff, we just have a final question from online. Um, we have, uh, could any useful information be garnered further away from uh, the present 60 light year limitation? Uh, it would sell better if it did. So it sounds a little bit like Frank's uh, comment. Yeah, so this is a telescope, remember, that in its most sensitive mode requires a bright, nearly point source to make all the mirrors work. If you're willing to make each of the mirrors separately unfazed, then it's a huge light collecting instrument. And so for doing uh, radio velocity studies of very distant stars, right, it's still a wonderful and, and earth shattering telescope for that. For the civilization problem and the detection of life, it probably is limited to something like 60 to eight. If we make it bigger, we could go further um, and, and it's scalable. But, but I would say that, that it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, 100 light years is the limit for other problems related to planet detection. Um, it's a huge light bucket, a light bucket with an eight meter aperture diffraction limited PSF, which is not anything to sneeze about, but with lots of collecting power. I know there are some questions that we didn't get to, so I'd encourage you to come up and, yeah. and, and chat to Jeff about this. Now, Jeff, we have a special uh, SETI Talks mug. Um, very appropriate. It's a couple of androids talking to each other. Fabulous. Perhaps, uh, on the corner of their Dyson sphere or something like oh, that. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah. Please, please join me in thanking Jeff for his great